Hi, I'm the workshop leader for the second annual Trademark That Thursdays Virtual Summit. And my name is Caleb Green. My masterclass is going to be on Police It, Intellectual Property and Enforcement Strategies. And I will provide vital information and strategies on how you can protect the intellectual property of yourself, your clients, and your business. Now, this, te- this talk is going to be taking place at the Trademark That Thursdays Virtual Summit taking place April 29th through the 30th. My background is in intellectual property strategy, including copyright, trademark, patents, and rights of publicity. So you want to join to learn more about how to enforce these areas of intellectual property on the internet, social media, and throughout the world. In addition, you'll have a great opportunity to network as well as glean industry insights and also to get CLE credit. So come join us April 29th through the 30th, the Trademark That Thursdays Virtual Summit. We want to see you there and you can follow Trademark That Thursdays on Instagram to learn more. Hello, everyone. Just give me one moment. I'm going to get my slides together here. Perfect. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. How's everyone doing? Hope everyone's been um, having a great time uh, during this wonderful virtual summit. I want to thank Nina for inviting me as well as um, for everyone uh, that's presented. Brittany did a great job. Um, and I just want to say it's very, it's actually very refreshing. I think I'm the only male speaker. And I think it's refreshing that we have a lineup of just incredible women attorneys in IP and in tech. Um, and I think it's about time that guys uh, kind of take, um, are the minority for, for once when it comes to these kind of uh, presentations. So I want to thank you um, thank you, Nina, and thank all the presenters. I'm going to go ahead and jump in. This is a um, presentation on uh, intellectual property enforcement strategies. And I think this is a very key point. And I hope, I'm hopeful that people can take away today is some different strategies that you can take, things you can add to your packages, um, whether you have a flat rate model, if you do things on an hourly basis, and you can just be a better resource to your clients. And so uh, that's what I'm hoping everyone takes away from today. Um, my name is Caleb Green. I'm an attorney out of Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, I work out of our uh, Dickinson Wright. We are a national firm, AM, uh, close to AM 100, like AM 120. Um, uh, we haven't quite broken through the 100 level yet, but we have about 19 different offices through the United States and in Canada. I work in our Las Vegas office where I practice primarily uh, intellectual property law. Uh, I practice mostly in trademarks copyright, but I also do a fair amount of litigation um, in all areas, trade secrets, patents, um, as well as uh, uh, trademark and copyright. Um, I graduated from the William S. Board School of Law at UNLV uh, in 2019. I also, prior to that, I actually have a computer science degree from the College of Engineering um, in UNLV, where I graduated in 2015. Um, I'm a former information technology professional, um, I'm also very involved in the ABAIP section where I'm a young lawyer fellow and also very involved in the National Bar Association. So uh, that's just a little bit about me. And uh, so you guys have an idea who who's talking to you guys today. Um, today's CLE, the purpose of this CLE is I'm going to briefly go over intellectual property rights. I'm not going to spend a ton of time. Obviously, you all have learned already enough from a lot of our previous speakers. Um, Many of most of you, if not all of you, are attorneys or at least in the legal field. So you all have some idea of copyright trademark. I will talk a little bit about a couple other areas. So I may go into a little explanation specifically on patents, trade secrets, and rights of publicity. But I'll kind of speed through some of the copyright work and the, the trademark stuff. It, it, hopefully, uh, for those of you who may not be as familiar with those areas, it'll be you know a, a quick um, 
summary. And then for those of you who practice in this area all the time, it'll be a refresher. So I'm, I'm going to go through those. Then I'm going to kind of discuss some of the various tools and strategies to enforce your intellectual property. I'll talk about litigation. I'll talk about that briefly and talk about a lot of the pros, but a lot of the cons, including the cost and the time. And then I'll talk about here are some other things, because a lot of times we have clients, they don't have the money and they don't have the time to deal with litigation. Let's just be frank. And a lot of times there may not be a case that behooves itself to be a good contingency case. For example, you may need to defend. You may need to. Um, it may be uh, a case where there may not be a lot of damages in place, um, but you may want to seek injunctive relief or something of that nature. So um, you may want to look to alternative uh, enforcement tools outside of litigation. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about a couple of examples in IP enforcement, specifically a lot that I've, I've dealt with personally. I'm going to actually bring some client stories uh, about how we've been able to uh, use some of these alternatives to litigation um, in order to give our clients some results and they didn't have to spend a lot of money and time uh, dealing with uh, litigation. <clears throat> so roadmap. First, I'm going to talk about just a brief overview of intellectual property law. Talk about copyrights, trademarks, rights of publicity, trade secrets, and patents. I'm going to go through those just so we are on the ba same basis of knowledge. Again, I'll kind of speed through that. Then I'm going to talk about it peppered in there will be how to secure your rights. Do you need a registration? Do you not? Again, things we already know. Um, many of you already know. Then enforcing your intellectual property rights. That's going to be kind of the meat of today's presentation. I'm going to give some examples and then have some time, hopefully, for some Q&A. So what is intellectual property? We all know this. It's been essentially the protection of intangible property. Ideas, concepts, and expressions captured in a tangible medium, right? Um, you know, we're recording these, these um, presentations, right? Right. There's a there's a level of, of expression there that's going to be protected. Uh, trade secrets, recipes, things of that nature. This th this is all the things that in the United States we've recognized are subject to some la level of protection. Um, and so that's essentially what, as we all know, this is what intellectual property is. Um, and they're just kind of in, in a way the United States law has just carved out specific areas and specific things. Uh, such as copyright, and they lay out, here's the standard for copyright, here's the standard for patents, here's what are, are patentable or um, uh, copyrightable subject matter, um, here's how you can get it, you know, here's how you can enforce it, and if someone violates and infringes on it, there are damages. Um, and so we, we have those spelled out in statutes, and but then also, you know, through the years, we found other ways of enforcing intellectual property, especially in the age, in the internet age, um, Brittany did a great job just before me talking about NFTs, right? That's a new area where now we're trying to figure out, we're waiting on these cases, you know, to come down. I think I just, I just, uh, got an email from one of the partners at my firm, uh, who I do a lot of NFT work. He sent me a link in the UK just came down with a, with an order that essentially, uh, <clears throat> provided case law in the UK that NFTs are now property, right? And we're still waiting on a lot of these <laughs> United States courts, to give us some decisions. And we have no idea. We have no idea how they're going to come down. Um, we have no idea how the judiciary is going to handle it. If they're actually going to understand NFTs. Um, and so that's an example. Of the, we're now in, in, a, um, in an age where we have these emerging technologies and we get to see the courts, how they grasp them. We get to see what, how do these fall as far as our current framework of intellectual property. Um, right now, it's the Wild West with these NFTs, um, but, but certainly very interesting. Um, and we're going to be able to see if there's going to be additional enforcements, right? Because right now, if someone's infringing on someone's NFT, if someone goes and takes a screenshot, someone's artwork, emits an NFT on OpenSea um, or any of these other marketplaces, it's a question of how, who do we go after? Do we go after the marketplace? Do I go after OpenSea? Do I try to find this person individually, right? We're dealing in an area where these are decentralized networks too. So it's difficult. Um, and so th that's why exploring these other enforcement strategies may be helpful for you because where litigation may be um, not just expensive and or, or uh, costly, but also impractical, you may need to uh, explore some other options in order to protect your client's work. So again, we're just gonna drop in, start with copyright. We all know this, copyright is exclusive legal right given to an author. You have the exclusive rights to reproduce, distribute, perform, create derivative works. 
right? These have to be human authors. They have to be fixed in a tangible medium, right? Um, as you see, the, the three requirements necessary has to be original, has to have minimal creativity, right? We know that minimal creativity is what courts call it de minimis, just has to have a very thin layer of creativity, um, can't be factual, can't be scenes of fair, um, must be original, meaning cannot be a, uh, a, uh, uh, a copy of someone else's work. Um, yep, and I, I agree, can't be, you know, the, the copyright office just came out with what we kind of already knew. I think we learned that from um, the Naruto case that copyright has to be a human author. It can't be a monkey. It can't be a, it can't be AI, right? It has to be a human author. Um, so again, we, I, the, I think the copyright office just a couple months ago came out with that. And, you know, many of us were like, well, well, no duh. Uh, we, that's, we've been learning that in law school for the last several years. Um, and we thought that was settled, but, you know, there's still a lot of arguments out there that people, people want to make, but um, has to be human author, fix in a tangible medium has to be original, has to have minimal creativity. So I'm an example person, and I'm, I'm going to jump to a couple examples later. Um, and we know copyright uh, attaches as soon as it's fixed in a tangible medium. It has, uh, as you can see, again, just a brief refresher on the duration. Uh, for single authors, author's life plus 70 years. Uh, if it's joint authors, you take the, li li uh, the life of the last surviving author and then add 70 years and it works for hire. 95 years from publication, 120 years from creation, whichever comes first. So examples. I love examples. I, I try to scree away from and move past a lot of the words on my presentations because I feel like this is really brings it to life. Um, photos, right? You take a, I joke with my friends all the time. They ask me, hey, take a quick picture of me. Take a quick picture of me and my friends, right? Technically, I'm the copyright owner, right? I'm the author. I framed it up. I had y'all move. I got the angles, right? I told you to move to the left a little bit, right? I'm the copyright owner of that image, right? Um, in that moment, right? When you take a selfie of yourself, you're the copyright owner, right? The moment it's you click that that uh, button on your on your iPhone, your cell phone, your smartphone, um, that's captured in a tangible medium in the form of a digital file, right? You now are the copyright owner. Um, graphical designs, music. Um, instruction manuals, right? We, I've actually gotten into some litigation over instruction manuals, and it's just kind of like an added layer. Uh, you know, we may be going after someone for patent infringement um, or trade dress infringement over a particular product. And then we also look at the instructions and we see, wow, there are a lot of similarities here. Throw it in there. Um, books, literary works, certain designs, um, choreography as well. You all may have heard, um, you know, remember that, that, that TikTok trend uh, with, I think, Megan Stallion's song, I'm a Savage, and that big dance, right? The, the person who came up with that dance actually, I think it took her about a year, but she actually has copyright registration on that dance as a choreography. Um, it's very difficult and tough to get, but it's also subject to copyright protection. Um, so these are just a couple of examples I just like to go over in explaining what copyright is. And I think it's also helpful to know what copyright doesn't protect. And that kind of gives you a, a better idea of where the line is. Um, works in the public domain. If you know, if it's been 70 years since the author's death, right, that work falls into the public domain. Um, Duke Law School actually does a really good job every year. They have an annualized list of works that are falling into the public domain. And I think this year, one of the notable ones was Winnie the Pooh, right? Not the Disney's iteration of Winnie the Pooh, but the general, um, the, the original developer of Winnie the Pooh um, before it was, you know, taken and changed by uh, Disney. Right, that has since fallen into the public domain. It falls into the public domain this year. So, um, you know, that's just an example. No longer subject to copyright. That particular, you know, Winnie the Pooh, um, as depicted by that author, is now in the public domain and free for anyone to use. Um, ideas, concepts, methods, those fall more so um, to patent. And I'll talk about a little bit about that later. Patent protection, uh, but not subject to copyright. Short phrases, titles, names, slogans, likewise, not subject to copyright protection. Um, use for articles as well, not subject to copyright protection. Um, so things, short phrases like, I'm a big fan of the Shark Tank, I'm out, right? Not going to be able to get copyright protection, but you may get trademark protection, depending on how you're using it. Just do it. I like this one because there's actually um, the sl the actual design of the Nike swoosh is like is subject to copyright protection, but, the le but just the statement, just do it, likely is not because it's a short phrase. So um, this is another example of 
copyright examples, um, just to give you a better understanding. Again, I'm going to kind of speed through these because we already know these. Registration, um, very important, especially when it comes to enforcement, because you cannot file a copyright claim unless you have a registration. Okay. Um, it also makes it a lot easier if you have a registration when you're trying to enforce. Uh, it just it gives you a presumption of ownership. Um, <clears throat> it also makes you eligible for statutory damages and in some cases attorney's fees. And that's helpful, especially when you're trying to enforce. And I'll talk about a little bit of that later when we talk about demand letters. Um, <clears throat> and also you can pr uh, provide for the protection of importation of infringing goods. Um, and I'll talk about that later on as well. But registrations are very helpful. I provided just a little information about cost and timing. There's an expedited option as well. I'm sure everyone knows about. But if you have someone who has a protected work, remember, okay, at common law, as soon as it's fixed in a tangible medium, you have copyright. But a lot of people don't rush to get a registration, right? They sit on it or they don't until someone infringes on it. They don't think about getting a registration. Well, if you're in a situation where there's pending litigation or you're about to file, a, you want to file a lawsuit against someone, you can file an expedited registration app or application with the U.S. Uh, Copyright Office uh, for $800 and you can get that. I've gotten in a matter of just a couple of days when we've had to do a rush registration. Um, so that's that's uh, just an example. Um, average time I, is about six months, might be a little bit more depending on what kind of work you're, you're dealing with. Um, I mentioned the choreography work took them a long time, just going back and forth with the Copyright Office. Kind of depends on the work, but generally um, the average time is about three to three to six months. So that's a little bit on copyright. I'm going to I'm going to go through trademark. This is obviously, you know, trademark that Thursdays. I'm pretty sure most of you know about trademark. So I'm going to speed through this. Um, we know trademarks are essentially they're essentially source identifiers. They can be phrases, symbols, designs, sounds, smells. Plato has a smell has a uh, has a trademark um, <clears throat> uh, registration on the smell of Plato. Um, and I believe Verizon also has a trademark registration on the smell in their stores, right? Uh, source identifiers. Uh, that's essentially what these do. They distinguish goods and services in the marketplace. And again, I'm an example of man. So we can look at a lot of these. A lot of these, you see the words, the name of a company or a brand, and you immediately know, okay, I know Google. Google search engines, for example. I know when I'm Googling something, I'm not going to Bing.com. I'm not going to MSN.com. I'm not going to Yahoo. I'm not using their search engines. I know I'm using Google's, right? It's uh, it's very, very different. Microsoft, right? I know the difference between, you know, if I have a, you know, Microsoft Surface or if I have an iPad, right? Based upon the branding, based upon the logo. Um, a lot of some of these, as you can see, those are spelled out. Uh, Walmart spelled out Bank of America. We know those, but there's other others, Starbucks. There's others that um, <clears throat> don't have any words at all, but they have a logo that we've come to know as a source identifier. The Apple logo, right? We see that. We know they sell technology, right? Pretty sure many of you have an iPhone, have an iPad, a MacBook, um, you know, uh, Apple Watch, right? When you see that Apple logo, you know, okay, I know what kind of quality goods I'm getting. I'm not getting, you know, um, a Microsoft product or I'm not getting an Android product. Um, source identifiers. I know if I see Nike swoosh on my shoes, that's different than Adidas. That's different than Reebok. That's different than the shoes I get from Payless or Walmart, right? Quality shoes. Um, so these are just, as you know, some examples, source identifiers, sound marks as well. You know, the T-Mobile jingle, um, my, McDonald's, you know, two all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. That's a slogan. We know they're talking about the Big Mac right? Source identifiers, that's what trademark law protects. Um, this, These are strengths of the mark. I'm not going to go into detail, but I do want to give kind of one of my favorite uh, examples when it comes about descriptive marks. You may use this. Uh, I like to use this when I'm talking to clients because it, it really brings it uh, together. But we know generic marks, marks that are just general, do not really identify any source, uh, any uh, kind of products or goods and services in the marketplace. Things like Velcro, aspirin, escalator, right? These were all at one point brands, but now we call any type of fiber adhesive uh, Velcro, right? We don't actually have a, dis there's, it's, it's hard to distinguish between, okay, is that Velcro? Uh, this is another brand. This is just some brand I got from Target. Um, you know, now we just call it all of those 
Velcro and they've been in, in, a, in a way it's become generic. Um, Kleenex, for example, hey, pass me that Kleenex and I'm passing you, you know, the great value brand I got from Walmart or, or I'm, I'm passing you maybe some Charmin or some other kind of brand. Right. And Kleenex has actually tried to go out of their way to try to not to get their mark to be generic for just uh, a tissue uh, paper. Um, so we know those don't get those aren't given trademark protection. Descriptive marks. Right. I love this is my favorite one because I'm always trying to explain to my clients about, OK, your mark may be descriptive here. Right. Descriptive describes the goods and services, but you can get trademark protection if there's acquired distinctiveness, if there's secondary meaning. So I tell people this. So imagine you're going to Seattle for the first time. You get off the plane and you walk up to someone and you say, where is Seattle's best coffee? Now, when you say that, there's two there's two options. The first one is someone's going to say, OK, you're asking my opinion of where Seattle's best coffee is. So I'm going to point you. Oh, I'm, I'm, I like Starbucks. So there's a Starbucks over there. Uh, I'm a, a personally I'm a coffee bean man. So uh, I may say, hey, there's a coffee bean around the corner. Um, you may say Dutch Bros or any other kind of coffee, right? Um, that's one area. And that's an example of when a mark does not have acquired meaning because uh, it doesn't actually distinguish goods and services. I think you're just describing what is Seattle's best coffee in that, in that vein. The flip side is if Seattle's best coffee has secondary meaning and people know it as a, as a uh, coffee shop of note, right? Then they'll say, oh, you're talking about Seattle's best coffee. Well, that specific work, uh, that specific coffee shop is around the corner. It's over there, you know, wherever. Right. And so those I just like using that example, because I think it breaks it down for people and they have a better understanding. Um, you, we know about suggestive marks. This takes a lot more brain power. Microsoft's a good example. Micro means microchip. It takes you a little bit more brain power for us to get to. OK, th there's a connection between the name and the goods and services, but it's not as uh, blatant as a descriptive mark. Arbitrary marks, these are marks that are already in existence, but we use them differently. Apple's a great example. Apple doesn't sell fruit. They don't sell apples. They sell technology. So we're using a, uh, a apple to uh, d uh, source identify uh, different goods and services in the tech space. So that's an arbitrary mark. And Fanciful, the strongest of them all, created just to be a trademark. So Polaroid, that word didn't exist until it was time for them to start making these photos and cameras. Um, they made that word up in, for it to uh, just serve as a trademark. So that gets the strongest protection. Um, securing rights, again, like copyright, as soon as you start using a name in commerce, you have common law, but you're limited, right? You have common law trademark protection, but you're limited. You may be limited to state. Um, you may be able to even use the Lanham Act, but you're going to be limited as far as you know, what kind of damages and rem remedies you're going to be able to get. You're not going to get a presumption of ownership and validity. Um, so it behooves people to get a registration. Um, many of us know the copyright, the, excuse me, the trademark office is extremely backed up. It is, I think I'm, I filed things back in probably May or probably uh, February last year that I'm just now getting getting examiners assigned to trademark applications. Um, they are just extremely backed up. They was already backed up before COVID. And then, you know, they did a hiring freeze for a while. Um, people did not stop filing trademarks. So the backlog just kept getting bigger and bigger. And now it's refreshing here. The trademark office is hiring a lot of people again. Um, I think they're going to be hiring a lot more people in the next couple of quarters. And so hopefully we can start getting that down. But it is going to take some time. So just keep that in mind. But also I want to point out, keep in mind state registrations. Those are very helpful. Um, a lot of state registrations, especially depending on the state, you may need to dive into what remedies you get. In, for, for example, in Nevada, where I practice, um, I'm licensed in Nevada and California, but in Nevada specifically, they, you're given, you're entitled to attorney's fees if we have a state registration and you infringe upon that registration. So very important and very helpful you may need to dive into state registration to see if they hit, give you some kind of entitlement to some kind of remedy, um, because that may be something that you can add um, when it comes to enforcing your client's IP. Uh, trade dress protects the look and feel. This is kind of a, an aside of trademark protection. Um, protects things like size, shape, color combinations. Um, it has to be non-functional and there has to be secondary meaning. Any of you that's filed a trade dress 
application with the trademark office knows you're immediately going to get an office action the minute you file a trade dress application and it's going to say you need to prove up secondary meaning um and they may also issue it if, if they think it's functional you may have to try to overcome that um but it, but it's very good and the great thing about trademark protection is it lasts as long as it's used in commerce um so uh very helpful there again we all know this i'm going to just just wanted to touch on that i'm going to move on um again and we know this and this is kind of the core of my presentation trademark protection it is responsibility of the trademark owner to make sure that his or her mark is being is not being used in property or without their authorization they have they have the responsibility to police it otherwise it will it may fall like uh for example i mentioned escalator aspirin velcro kleenex it may become generic and they may lose trademark protection and anyone may be able to use that mark and so they need to be careful uh, whether you're whether it's you have a licensing agreement you need to put in quality control provisions um, you may also in in some cases you know if, for example if you have a franchise uh, for example you may need to tell them this is how you use it um, if there's a particular product you may need to uh, educate the the uh, distributors on listen this is how we use our mark and you need to make sure you're not using it in the generic way we need to make sure we point out the differences between my product and someone else's product so that people don't get them conflated and doesn't fall um, subject to generic side. So um, just something to keep in mind and why it's very important to enforce, enforce all your IP, but especially trademarks, because you stand to lose a lot. Okay, trade secrets, gonna go through these briefly. Trade secrets are essentially, um, <clears throat> has to be a, uh, information that's kept a secret, has to have some kind of commercial value because it's secret, and you have to take some forms of reasonable steps to keep that information secret. So uh, I like to use a couple of examples here. Um, recipes, algorithms, those all may be subject as trade trade secrets. Um, I like to use Coca-Cola, right? Coca-Cola goes to extreme lengths to keep their recipe and Coca-Cola recipe uh, formula a secret, right? You know, I hear all the jokes. They keep it in a vault under a volcano, you know, surrounded by armed guards, you know, in the, you know, in some remote island somewhere, right? You don't need to go through all that. Your client doesn't need to go through all that. Using things like non-disclosure agreements, um, <clears throat> uh, non-competes in some cases may be enough to, to show that you've reasonably taken some steps to try to keep it a secret. Uh, some other good examples, the recipe for KFC, chicken, um, Krispy Kreme donuts, their recipe, Twinkies, Listerine. These are all uh, recipes that are subject to trade secret protection. Um, so some things, how do you keep your trade secrets, right? Well, the good thing is you don't have a registration process, um, but you do wanna make sure that you limit the number of people who know about it. Uh, you wanna keep uh, you wanna keep that in mind um, when it comes to, oh, is this something I wanna keep a trade secret? This also comes into play when I talk about patents a little bit later, um, about you may need to choose between whether you wanna file a patent, which requires disclosure, or keep a trade secret, which doesn't require disclosure. Um, uh, as I mentioned, confidentiality agreements, non-competes, you may want to put those and in, in, encourage your clients to put those in their employment agreements. Um, another big thing, filing public disclosures of trade secrets. You want to make sure you do those under seal. This comes into play, not just in litigation, not just in discovery. Obviously, you, you, know, you have to give some information over. You want to make sure you market attorney's eyes only. Um, if it's trade secret, because you don't want the client, their client seeing that, especially if they're a competitor, um, the opposing party will have will be able to look at that. So you want to be careful. I think we know about that. But other things, especially when we talk talk about uh, certain businesses, right? Or you're talking about the cannabis space or other spaces, um, tech space as well, where you may need to do certain disclosures, um, and they may require of certain products, right? And they may uh, may be looking for you to put in certain information, uh, whether it's customer lists. Uh, or um, you may need to provide, let's you know, say you're working with the FDA or some other kind of regulatory body, right? You want to file these under seal where you may be giving out recipes or um, you know, information regarding your algorithms that you want to keep protected, right? Because otherwise that public disclosure, even though it's a required filing uh, for you know whatever license or regulation body or regulations you're trying to comply with, you can still 
inadvertently give up your trade secret rights because you publicly disclose it. So keep that in mind. You may need to brush up on your open meeting law and your filing under seal in your particular states, or if it's a federal filing, you may want to brush up on those because you may actually uh, find yourself in a position where you may inadvertently expose uh, and jeopardize your client's trade secret rights just in through a, a public disclosure. Um, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, it's there's no limit on time with trade trade secrets. There's no registration costs. Has immediate effect. Um, and again, it's all based upon no disclosure of, innovate, of the information. The disadvantages, right? I could take, for example, Coca Cola, and I could reverse engineer the recipe, right? I could do that, and that would be completely lawful. And then I could, you know, share that recipe online, and there goes Coca Cola's trade secret protection. Um, so in their Coca-Cola uh, product. So that that's one di disadvantage of trade secrets. Once a secret is public, anyone has access to it, trade secret protection is gone. And it also can be difficult to enforce. The We just typically, generally, um, prior to 2017, uh, trade secrets typically something that states had uh, either common law protection for or some kind of statute. And in 2017, the Defending Trade Secrets Act actually went into place. So we now have a, a federal uniform law that applies, but it's fairly new. We're talking about a law that's been in effect going on. It'll, I think it'll have its fourth anniversary this year. So it's not a ton of case law on these, very difficult to enforce. So just keep that in mind when it comes to litigation, a little difficult to try to protect these. And as you'll see later, it's very costly. So keep that in mind. And then lastly, your pat, your, your, um, whatever your trade secret is, could be patented by someone else, right? Someone else could could independently come upon it and patent it and disclose it, and there goes your trade secret. So just keep that in mind. So now we talked about trade secret. Let's talk about patents. So I'm going to kind of go through this quickly, but uh, I don't uh, prosecute patents. I do have a technical background. I don't prosecute patents, meaning I don't help people get patents issued from the patent office, but I do help enforce them through litigation and other means. So these are essentially a property rights granted to an inventor. These are effectively for um, <clears throat> uh, ideas, concepts, and you can exclude people from making, using, selling, um, importing these inventions or particular concepts, methods, uh, designs, or even plants into the United States. Um, so there's big things about disclosures, right? Thing, I think the big thing is there's a one year bar from disclosure. Right. If you disclose something, you publish something, your invention, your design, um, uh, excuse me, your invention, you have a one year bar and you have one year where you can go in uh, from that date of disclosure to file either a provisional application or a non provisional patent application. And I'm going to talk about the differences there. And one of the key takeaways I want everyone to take away with guard patents, if you don't take anything away, is the difference between a provisional patent application and a non provisional patent application. So uh, there are three types of patents. There's design. This protects how an invention looks. Utility pr uh, protects how a uh, invention works. And plants, uh, these are just kind of uh, plants that are reproduced scientifically. Um, so there are different terms. Design patents get 14 years. Utility patents get 20 years. Plant patents get 20 years. Plant patents I'm not going to talk about, but it's it's one that's growing, especially as we get into other areas of um, uh, especially like the cannabis space, for example, some people want to file are and are allowed to file even uh, cannabis related uh, patents. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Um, utility patent. This is one of my favorites. Michael Jackson. We remember he did that anti gravity lean. I know y'all know what I'm talking about. Uh, that was actually I learned that that is actually a patented shoe. So he has a shoe that has a, a kind of a hitch in the bottom that latches on to a rod that's fastened into the stage. And so him and the dancers, right, would essentially uh, lock their, their shoe into the rod and then they could keep their legs straight without bending their spine. Uh, and that's what gave the like anti-gravity illusion. And they actually, Michael Jackson actually has a, a utility patent on this particular shoe. It's very interesting. Uh, but this is an example of utility patent. It protects how the shoe works. Right. So you see all those designs. I'm not getting into all the designs and all the claims today. We're not getting into that detail. But this is just an example of a utility patent. Very cool. Very interesting. Um, design patents protects how it looks. So I like to use these. Uh, these are Oakley glasses. 
So design patents are a little bit more easier to read because you just look at what is claimed. So uh, essentially here you see the, the Oakley glasses, the, uh, the front frame is actually what's uh, kind of the darker, um, il it's uh, illustrated through the solid lines in that uh, patent uh, that's on the screen. That's an example of what's protected in this design patent. And it presents the ornamental designs of, the, of, of uh, this particular glasses. So just keep that in mind. Um, you can, and this is, this is really strong because if you have a design patent, right, you can actually go after people and for having similar products. So it's very helpful. Um, also applies in the, in the area of apps. So here's an example. Apple and Samsung have gone back and forth, I don't know how many times in all kinds of patent litigation, especially regarding their, phone, their iPhones, Androids, et cetera. Um, so another example of design patents in the tech space here. So here's some, just some general patent requirements for a design patent. It has to be novel, has to be original, non-obvious, and it has to be ornamental. Um, so it has to have some kind of design, um, has to be original, non-obvious, can't be a copy. Uh, utility patents have to be novel, non-obvious, and useful. So just keep that in mind. Uh, a design patent has to have a non-functional non aspect whereas a utility patent has more of a functional aspect. So that's kind of the big distinguish, distinguishing factor there. Okay, so one of the biggest things I want everyone to take away from this presentation is that the difference between a non-provisional patent application and a provisional patent application. So I hear this all the time. I, I mentioned before, I watch Shark Tank a lot, okay? Shark Tank, I hate it when they say this. Do you have a patent? And they say, yes, I have a provisional patent. And I lose my mind because there's no such thing as a provisional patent. A, uh, there is what we call a provisional patent application. Now, provisional patent application, as I'll talk about here, a provisional patent application gives you a priority date. What does that mean? That means, let's say you have a client who has a product. They're not ready to file a non-provisional patent application. That's an actual official patent application. But they's like, I need a little bit of time. I want to start putting this into the market. Right. What can I do? Well, then you can tell them, you, you know, we can get with a patent attorney, um, reach, you know, reach out to any of your patent friends. If you don't know any, I can help you um, and my firm can help you. But um, you reach out to them and say, look, we need to file a provisional patent application that gives your client one year. Right. From the day they file that they can start using and disclosing this mark or disclosing their product, selling it. And they have one year to file a non-provisional application. So this can be helpful, um, especially in, in areas where uh, you're not sure about whether or not they disclose it or not, right? That gives you an effective priority date and you can use that. Um, it, one good thing about this is while you have a, a provisional patent application pending, you can use the patent pending language. So much like how we use the R symbol or we use the C symbol for copyright to as a deterrence, you can you put patent pending on those products while there's a patent actually pending. You don't, and you can do that with a provisional patent application filed while you're waiting, while you're enjoying that kind of one year grace period. The non-provisional is what actually gets you in what gets pushed through as a patent application, right? And so that's when you say, I have filed a patent application. So that just keep that in mind. A lot of clients get that uh, will come to you and say, oh, I have a patent on this particular product. And they don't really you need to do a little bit more digging on whether or not they have a provisional patent application or non-provisional application. Um, so uh, again, differences here, I'm not gonna uh, cost in time when it comes to patent applications. These can be uh, uh, very costly. Um, just the filing fees alone are a lot when it comes to patents. There's a lot of uh, filing fees, search fees, et cetera. Um, and that, that's not even talking about what the attorney for their time, what they're going to, what they're going to um, include. So that's something also you wanna keep in mind. Um, <clears throat> can be very costly. It takes utility patents can take up to three years to get. You think the trademark office is back. The patent process takes forever. Um, design patents can take you just over a year in order to get it as well. So something to keep in mind um, <clears throat> when it comes to these can be really expensive. So and I bring this up because this is where trade trade secrets and patents clients have an option there. Right. Do I want to disclose? have a little bit more rights here. Do I have the money and capital to really push through a patent and then later enforce it? So some things you want to just take into consideration. Um, 
I'm going to kind of move ahead here past patents, uh, employee inventions. You want to keep in mind state laws in Nevada. There's we actually have that uh, a law that says employers are the sole owners of patentable inventions or trade secrets created by an employee. That's the general rule in Nevada. And so you want to keep that in mind. So states may have different rules. You just want to keep that in mind. I'm going to jump to rights of publicity and then jump into enforcement because I want to leave at, at least I want to try to leave 10 minutes here um, for questions. So rights of publicity, I'm going to be really quick on these name, image and likeness rights. We've heard a lot about these NCAA allowing their rules, uh, relaxing their rules a little bit. Um, a lot of the uh, uh, states, the state of Nevada has required, has passed the law, uh, like many other states that prohibits, you know, universities from uh, prohibiting their student athletes from exploiting their name, image, and likeness rights. So is it a property right? Is it a privacy right? There's always been this battle state by state. Uh, so you need it. It's, this is going to be a state law intensive issue, uh, but very important for you to understand, especially when I talk about some things later. Uh, but generally, uh, even though these, there are some differences in the states, generally, you know, you're going to have a right of publicity claim. If someone uses someone's name, image, or their likeness without their permission, if they use it for a commercial purpose, right? And the good thing about these is there's, there's no registration process. You kind of just have these outright. Uh, again, your state common law would dictate what, you know, right of publicity claim is. So you may need to do a little bit of digging, but this is kind of the general general rules here. So I bring this up because I want to give a good example. Okay, I have a client um, in Nevada. Uh, they are Dream Big Nevada. They are a big immigration grassroots nonprofit. So they reach out to me because um, I'm one of the only IP attorneys they know. And they say, okay, we just got this cease and desist letter. We are nonprofit. We found this photo of our founder online and we just, we downloaded it and used it on our, uh, on our website, right? It's a picture of our founder. Surely we should be able to use this. And I had to walk them through a discussion of copyright law versus rights of publicity. And that was, that was, it was an education moment for them. Um, luckily I was able to like, I think we settled the matter. It was a copyright troll. Um, so we ended up settling the matter. I did a pro bono, settled it for like 500 bucks. Um, so they got out of it, but I, I kind of had to explain them a lesson that even if it is a photo of you, you may not have the right to use it. Now that other person, even though they have the copyright protection, as we talked about before, right. Uh, use the example. I take a picture of you and your friends, right. I can't just take that. I, I may be the copyright owner of that image, right. But I can't just take that and start slapping it on billboards and using it in marketing and et cetera, right? I have to, that would be using someone else's name, image, and likeness in, uh, for a commercial purpose, right? Without their authorization. So that's a situation where you may see crosshairs between copyright and rights of publicity. You may want to be careful there. So that's a big example of how this happens. Um, I know I'm talking about enforcement, but I think this is also important just to recognize, explain to your clients. Sometimes they're going to have that. They're going to have that. I have another client, Hookah Lounge in um, in uh, Inglewood, and they bought a pay-per-view of one of these fights. They bought the residential one. They didn't get a commercial license. They get a cease and desist letter for showing it. And it was a, it's, a, it's kind of a it was a difficult battle with educating them on copyright law. So you may need to go and explain these to people um, just so they have a better understanding. A lot of people on the business side, they learn about LLCs. Oh, I can write off my Mercedes, you know, as a business expense. No one's talking to them about IP. So you, I bring this up because you may need to take some extra steps to inform your clients about intellectual property law, uh, the rights and, and what they can and cannot do. So moving on IP enforcement, the meat of this, let's get into this different examples here, right? Digital Millennium Copyright Act, take, take down notice, litigation. I'm going to jump into all of these um, as different forms of, of enforcement that you can use for your clients. So litigation, okay? Costly and timely. Copyright, I'm just, you see it all here. Copyright, you're looking at, you know, this, and these are averages that I just pulled online. This is the average cost of U.S. copyright claims. Um, I think going back, I think about 2018, 2019, I don't have the more recent numbers. Uh, but I can tell you, it, if anything, it's gotten more expensive. Um, you're looking at half a quarter of a million dollars at least. Uh, trademark, you're looking at at least half a million dollars. Trade secrets, two million. Patents, you're looking at two million plus. Um, needless to say, litigation isn't always helpful, right? We, I, I have small clients. I'm sure many of you have clients who do not have the capital 
Um, they're not big companies who can just fuel the capital for a big litigation matter in federal court. So we have to look to other matters. And they also don't have the time. Um, a lot of these take, you're looking at a, at least a year for a lot of these matters to get resolved. Um, so again, litigation may not, is probably one of the key ways we do enforcement, but may not be the best way. So we may need to look to other alternative forms, trademark trial and appeal board, the TTAB, the patent trial and appeal board, uh, the copyright claims board, which will be in place in June of this year. Um, they have a deadline. It will be in place. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uniform domain name resolution policy, UDRP, right? These are alternative uh, forms of litigation or, or ADR uh, arbitration that you can use that may be a little less costly, maybe faster. And I'll talk about those briefly. The TTAB, right? This is uh, the TTAB is going to be limited to uh, essentially the TTAB determines whether or not a trademark registration maintains its registration or an application will transition into a registration. That's essentially their jurisdiction, right? They're not giving out damages. They're not going to do, they may do likelihood of confusion analysis, but not for the purpose of infringement, just for the purpose of determining whether or not this mark um, is confusingly similar and whether or not we're going to issue a registration or not. So this can be helpful for you if you're trying to, let's say, stop someone from filing um, a infringing mark. Um, and you may think that the examining attorney may have gotten it wrong, right? This is an op option. It's cheaper than federal court. It can be faster. There are a couple differences, right? Discovery is going to be a little bit different. There's going to be no live testimony. So this is a, a particularly, uh, uh, let's say you're trying to kind of tug on the heartstrings of a judge or a jury, right? You may not have that, that benefit that you would in court where you can get someone, you get the witness up there, get them telling their story, get the, get the judge on their side, get the jury on their side. Uh, as far as sympathetic, sympathy wise, you may not have that option. Also, there's a difference in when it comes to discovery, right? Uh, we know in federal court, you're limited to about 25 interrogatories. Well, in, in the TTAB, you get 75. You also get 75 requests for admissions, right? But, uh, where, where you're limited, that's a con in the uh, TTAB because in under the FRCP, you have an unlimited request for admissions. So just some things to keep in mind, can be faster, it's a little bit cheaper, but is it also another option? The Copyright Alternatives Small Claims Enforcement Act. So y'all remember, remember them $600 checks, either you got one or you know someone who got one at the end of 2020, we was like, yeah, let's get these stimulus checks. I'm here for it, right? That whole bill wasn't just about stimulus checks. It was an omnibus bill that included many laws, including this one, which is a small claims copyright board that's in the US Copyright Office. Now this is limited to small claims cases for copyright. So you have to be seeking $30,000 $30, or less. And there's a requirement for consent from both parties. So that's one of the things, that's one of the cons here is that both parties have to agree to ar arbitrate this particular matter in the before the CCB. But it's very cheaper. It's going to be a lot cheaper than copyright litigation. Is it going to be faster? That remains to be seen because it's not, obviously I mentioned, this doesn't go into effect until the latest date they can they have to get it up and running is in June. I think it's June 27th, 2022. Um, so we don't know, but we do know that they will have limited motion practice. Um, they also are going to have a vetting process. So whereas, you know, you if you filed in, in a federal court a copyright claim, you would have the you would have to, uh, you know, you'd be able to determine whether or not this was uh, providing an actual cause of action, you know, by doing a motion to dismiss challenge. Right here, they're actually going to already have attorneys that vet them, make sure you're pleading the right, uh, make sure you have a copyright registration or at least an application filed. They're going to make sure uh, that you're pleading for less than thirty thousand um, dollars. So this is just another option, a little bit faster. Um, there's no injunctive relief, and again, limited motion practice is a pro and a con. Because on one hand, it's like okay, you're not going to have a lot of 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 uh, motion practice to have to defend against but also you're limited and there's going to be a limit to experts we know experts drive up the cost of litigation a lot if you have to do factual discovery and then expert discovery right after that it becomes a lot more costly so there's going to be a limit you have to really prove up that you need an expert but those are just some things to keep in mind and this could be an option udrp udrp is essentially run by ICANN. essentially these govern domain names so if there is an infringing domain name instead of trying to file uh, under the Lanham Act or the Anti-Cyber uh, Squatting Act, which you, Protection Act, excuse me, the ACPA, you can file, you can go through the UDRP and you can seek either transfer 
or you can uh, deactivation of an infringing domain name. So this is cheaper, it's a lot faster, and they're a little bit more lenient, I, in my opinion. Um, now, and this is great because this could be good form work. You can really, if you start doing this a lot, even in our firm, we do this. We have just a body of UDRP complaints. And we oftentimes just will see a infringing domain name and we'll just look through one of our forms and we're able to change a lot of the information. Um, and it, it actually becomes really good work and we can we actually file uh, use a, a nice flat rate and it works for us and we're able to be profitable that way. So that's a good example and something you may want to use if there's an infringing domain name. Setting going to litigation, use the UDRP as an option and, and uh, you can that can be a less costly option uh, for your clients um, in order to get either transfer or deactivation of that infringing domain name. Um, I kind of just summarized all of this. The standard there, just for UDRP complaints, you have to show likelihood of confusion. You have to show that they have no legitimate rights and that, that they're using it in bad faith. But one thing to keep in mind with UDRP is that the GDRP is in, is is really, um, and I know I'm using a lot of alphabet soup here. The GDRP was a, a law passed in the EU, which basically gives people the right to forget, meaning that certain information uh, that's gathered, you know, those though the the owners of that personal information, or they give it to some kind of company, they have the right to forget that information, meaning um, it makes it a little bit harder when you're trying to figure out, okay, who's the owner? So with UDRP, just keep this in mind, you will likely have to file an amended complaint. Because when you first file the complaint, you have to try to include information from the domain name. You'll likely go to Whois, one of the Whois lookups online, and you'll get a page like this. And But you'll see if you look under registrant's name, right, it says non-disclosed. If you look under uh, the, the organization, it doesn't have anything. The street, non-disclosed, 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 right? So what you're likely going to have to do, this, this is uh, for YouTube-X.com, right? Um, I just found this online. So this is an example of was likely an infringing page, but you're likely going to have to file with, the, with ICANN. Once you file this, they will contact the registrar and the registrar will provide that information. Then you'll have to file an amended complaint by including that information. Right. And then you may have to make some changes. So just keep that in mind. It may this may also add an extra step. It may govern how you frame uh, how much time it's going to take, how much it's going to cost. So just keep that in mind. But still, UDRP is a great example. OK, demand letters getting close to the end here. Um, also called cease and desist letters. We know what these are. Just some necessary information you want to put in there. Information about your client, the infringement, the strength of your client's rights, et cetera, et cetera. Right. These are a form of enforcement because I've had a lot of people send a demand letter to. Right. Hey, I'm sorry. We'll stop doing this. We'll pay the money. You know, send us a settlement agreement and bada boom, bada bang. You're done. You're in and out. Um, so th these are can be examples. They also can be the preface for further litigation. But you want to be careful with demand letters because they can lead to declaratory judgments, which can be used offensively or defensively. So off declaratory judgments are, are interesting because they're typically filed in state court, even if they're addressing some kind of issue of federal law. Um, <clears throat> and so that's why they can be an issue of uh, offensive or defensive tool, because if you receive a demand letter, you can you can seek, uh, you know, saying that you're infringing, you can seek declaratory relief where state court would declare you're not infringing. Um, or you, you can, on the flip side, file a declaratory action in court to say in state court that said that this person is actually infringing. And it's it, problematic. And it, you want to be careful, at least when it comes to demand letters, because you can subject yourself to jurisdiction of another of another state that you may not want to be fighting in. So you got to be careful when it comes to these um, because they can be used defensively or offensively, um, especially in the situation if you receive the damn uh, demand letter someone's received a demand letter or you send a demand letter to someone, they can immediately take that demand letter if you don't craft it right and go to a state court and say, we want a declaration that says we're not infringing here. And now, you're, now your client has to get in a battle uh, in, in some state court that they may not have wanted. So ways we can kind of get around this is, sure, of course, you want to make sure you have a claim. Um, you may want to do some evaluation to make sure you're not just filing a frivolous demand letter. But also you may want to massage the language. Instead of using, you know, my client will, if you don't, you know, comply with our demands by such and such date, my client will file an infringement action. You want to, may want to say my client will explore his options, right? That doesn't necessarily give rise to a potential claim. You're just saying we're going to explore our options. I'm just letting you know that you may be breaking the law here. 
right? And that may give you a lot of avoidance to say, hey, you may not have standing to bring a, de a declaratory judgment claim here. So just something to keep in mind there. Okay, online, I'm going to jump through these really quick. Takedowns. Um, we know DMCA, we know Trademark, a lot of these uh, social media sites and uh, online marketplaces like Amazon, Apple, iTunes, uh, Twitter, Facebook, eBay. If there's an infringing mark out there, if there's an infringing product out there, you can file a takedown. I think we all know these, but just something to keep in mind. Um, yes, I know we got about five minutes. I'm going to be wrapping up here in just a second. Um, just something to keep in mind. These are helpful. And I love these because you can file these directly with the social media site or the ISP and you don't ever have to deal with the other side and they'll just remove it in many cases. Um, now, it does take some time um, to, to push these through and they typically have forms. And this is where having a trade trademark registration and copyright registration is helpful because if you attach those in my in my purview, we've almost been very we have like a 90 percent success rate, especially when we have a registration to attach in order to get in those infringing materials removed. Um, I do want to say this and I'll move on. Use the terms of use. And this is for those IP adjacent issues, right? This is the, uh, the terms of use from Instagram. On the bottom says you can't do anything unlawful, misleading, fraudulent, or illegal, or unauthorized purpose on their, on their site, right? This is wonderful language for loose issues that are maybe it's a it's a it's a squishy ip issue is it fair use or not you can use these to show this is why it's misleading this is why it's unlawful this is where rights of publicity come into play right this is unlawful because it's an improper use under you know texas state law texas state law says you can't use you know xyz for these purposes and this is unlawful and you can file a takedown with with instagram and we've been successful i'm going to give a couple examples and then i'm going to minty bong water is one of my, my you may know him he has a he's he got he drinks tea um he also does uh uh he has a lot of crystals and uh, a lot of plants uh has a lot of followers he had reached out to me and asked me to he had a bunch of fake social media sites that were selling these products with his name image and likeness so i use those right i missed it with a copyright argument and we were able to get those removed in a matter of a couple of days um i also was able to get a review removed Right. And this was a Google review um, for one of my clients. Um, and they essentially made a couple of statements that my client felt were like hate speech. They made fun of this woman's accent, uh, said she wasn't from this country, blah, blah, blah. And we were able to make an argument that that was unlawful hate speech um, and improper. And Google took it down. Um, so this is an example. Use the terms of use. Re review those because you can file a claim there and, and be able to use fraudulent. What's fraudulent? You, be a lawyer, argue. This is unlawful. This is misleading information. Uh, we even got a recording removed uh, and said it was a violation of the Wire Act. So these are examples. Use the terms of use in terms of conditions to your advantage. And then lastly, Customs, Borders, and Patrol. This is a great use. If you have a registration, you can actually file your copyright or trademark registration with U.S. Customs, and you can go and train them to find counterfeit products and they can actually seize them at the border and they won't make it into the United States, at least through import. Won't stop the planes from bringing it in, but at least things that are being shipped in off of, off of uh, boats, you'll be able to stop those. And this is great because you can add this to your, uh, your, your package when it comes to enforcement uh, or even registration. So it just adds to that. So I know I was kind of rushing through, there's a lot to cover today, but this is some of my contact information. Please feel free to reach out to me if you all have any questions. Um, I'm going to try to have about a minute left, so I'll try to jump in. Uh, let me see if I can answer at least one question here. Um, da -da -da. So let me let me address about the case. So the one question says, I've been following the launch of the Copyright Small Claims Board. And do you think that uh, we're actually going to get damages back? Um, so I think this is the thing with, when it comes to... Um, and I, yes, I, I think, Samantha, you brought, a, you brought a good point. This is exactly what I was going to say. I think that we'll see the case act be put in just like with regular arbitrary uh, arbitration clauses or mediation clauses. That's, I think, where we're going to be able to get people on the hook. And I think that's where we could advocate for our clients when they're getting a contract that we put in there an arbitration clause that says if there's any issues that arise under copyright. The parties agree to adjudicate them in under you know the, the CCB if they have jurisdiction. And I think that's the way we can actually enforce that and get around that mutual consent rule. I think that's the biggest way uh, that we're actually going to be able to use that and can actually enforce it through the CCB. So um, I think I just I'm just now hitting my um, 
my my last uh, last couple seconds here. So I'll pass it over to Nina. Um, again, I'm available for questions. Um, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my contact information is there. I'll also put it in the chat so you guys can reach out if you guys have any questions. We love it. We love it, Caleb. And, you know, give us something to challenge my audience with, like literally give them something after listening to your talk. What would you challenge them to do? Would you challenge them to ask or start doing in their practices to really go? And y'all, I like these little law reviews. These things, I'm not, I'm not saying little because it's just my way of talking, but I like these law review sessions better than I liked any law school class. So you and Brittany, I'm going to tell you the same thing. Like you should really consider making this some type of weekly or daily thing, kind of like I do a trademark that Thursdays in this context, because you're both so good at giving updates and all the other people do is send emails. And we're sick of it. We're sick of it. When I tell you we are sick of it, we are tired of getting them long emails about stuff. We would rather hear you talk about it because it's so much easier to understand when someone breaks it out like this. So I'm going to tell you the same thing I told Brittany. Literally, I should I would recommend you do this like something weekly because this was so useful. And I just, I, you and Brittany should collab. Y'all would actually fit very well together the way that y'all talk about stuff. So maybe consider that. I'm just throwing it out there. You know, I'll come on there with you. I mean, you know, I love all things trademark IP and I would love to talk about this. We could have a whole little TV station on our own in our own little air meets and people could come. I got this whole program for another two months so we can make it happen, y'all. So if y'all are interested in that, let me know. And y'all are all welcome who came to this event. It still has a 100 receipt maximum requirement. So again, y'all can come. Um, of course, if we do a collab, you know, I'm definitely going to recommend they do a paid collab. But that's just me. You know, I'm just throwing it out there. But we'll talk about that on another day, y'all. Kayla, give them something to walk away with. And then we're going to bring on my news anchor. And that is your last lawyer of the day. And then you have one more talk from my 17-year-old virtual assistant. So please do not miss the 17-year-old Micah Key. She is making her debut. She is about to break out into the speaking world with me, your girl who's breaking out in financial literacy. So please, Kayla, give these people what they want, something. because they. I would just say, just reiterate, look at the terms of use on all these websites. Use them to your advantage, um, especially in squishy areas. It, it, if, you're, if your client has, a, if there's a fake online profile with them, you can use that to go after these people. And that, again, you can add to what you're providing your clients and value to your clients. So use those. Uh, they're faster than just reporting uh, or using the other tools. Use the takedown methods. Enforce the their those terms of use. Instagram and Facebook are trying to use them against us, right? When they ban your account or whatever, use it Use it on the other way. It doesn't always have to be defensively. Use it on the off offensive end. Love it. All right. Well, Waylene, come on, man. Give us our bop. Put that CLE code on the screen. And it's time for Jessica about how to pitch your brand and news anchoring. And it literally follows Caleb's like so well because now we're using it effectively. Again, uh, let's go. I better get hyped for Jessica. Last live speaker, last live speaker. 